Before Elon Musk, before Steve Jobs, there was an American inventor so genius and so outrageous that he became a household name. Hollywood loved him. Supermodels wanted him. The FBI arrested him. And every automobile company in America hated him. However, this outspoken hustler outsmarted them all and in the process invented a sports car so iconic that even today the world's richest people hunt to collect the last remaining automobiles. This playboy's name is John DeLorean. And this is the unbelievably true story of how a shy but gifted engineer from Detroit went from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows and beyond the roads. Like many immigrants in the early 1900s, Zachary and Catherine DeLorean came to America as a young couple. They bounced around from job to job, finally settling in Detroit, Michigan. Zachary had little education and hardly spoke English, picking up odd carpentry jobs. His wife Catherine suffered abuse from her husband's alcohol and drug addiction. Amidst the chaos in 1925, their eldest of four sons, John DeLorean, was born. John's childhood in a turbulent household was a trauma he would run from his entire adult life. At one point, John's mother took him to live in Southern California for a while. John loved it. The beaches, the fast cars, the beautiful women. It was a way of life John had never seen, and he could never unsee it. School was a safe haven for John. He was extremely gifted, excelling in high school and winning a scholarship to study at the Lawrence Institute of Technology in Highland Park. The school produced many great automobile designers at this point, and John DeLorean flourished in the study of industrial engineering. John grew up around cars and was determined to put his engineering skills to work to find success and create a name for himself outside of his family's dark shadow. Unfortunately, that would have to wait. World War II. John's college was interrupted when he was drafted for military service into the U.S. Army. He served for three years. Honorably discharged in 1946, at the age of 21, he returned home to find that times had not gone well for his mother and three younger siblings. John immediately got a job as a draftsman for the Public Lighting Commission, and he worked there for a year and a half to improve his family's life before continuing his engineering education at Lawrence. While studying, John took a job at an automobile company. He worked at Chrysler at a local body shop. John was a shy, soft-spoken kid. A foreman at Chrysler's engineering garage recommended John apply to the company's postgraduate education facility. The Chrysler Institute of Engineering allowed recent graduates to advance in their education by gaining real-world experience in automotive engineering. John was a perfect fit for the program. And soon after, in 1952, at the age of 27, he earned a master's degree in automotive engineering and promptly joined Chrysler's team. However, John's career at Chrysler was short-lived. After only one year, he was offered an engineering position at Packard Motor Company, a luxury automobile company, for an annual salary of $14,000, considered a huge sum at the time. But like many companies after suffering through the Great Depression and the World War, Packard had taken a hit as the demand for luxury automobiles were being replaced by cheaper, more practical cars, and Packard was facing financial difficulties. But this became an opportunity for John. He quickly climbed the ranks at Packard with his patented improvement of the Ultramatic Automatic Transmission. DeLorean's change gave vehicles an improved torque converter and dual-drive range. It was later relaunched as the Twin Ultramatic. The success of his transmission improvements allowed DeLorean to rise quickly at Packard. After just four years, John overtook his own boss, Forrest McFarlane, and became the head of research and development. However, it was too little too late. 1956, as Packard was merging with Studebaker and seeing no future in the company, DeLorean received a call from Oliver Kelly, Vice President of Engineering at General Motors. Kelly had heard of the innovations John made at Packard and offered John his choice of a job in any of GM's five divisions with a starting salary of $16,000. John quickly jumped at the opportunity and his life was about to change. 1956, at the age of 31, John DeLorean joined General Motors as assistant to Chief Engineer Pete Estes and General Manager Seaman Knudsen in the Pontiac Division. This became a turning point in his career, going on to define the next few decades of his life. Working under Estes and Knudsen, he finally had the mentors he needed to fully tap into his immense potential. John's most iconic achievement was the Pontiac GTO, which was named after the Ferrari 250 GTO. 
It was the world's first muscle car, and it quickly climbed to third place in annual industry sales in the United States. This launch marked the beginning of Pontiac's renaissance, and John had a vision for it. It was simple. John DeLorean knew what people wanted. Recalling his early childhood days in Hollywood, California, he knew the desire to want a life of beaches, beach bodies, and beach parties, and John put that feeling into cars. Besides the GTO, John also developed the Pontiac Firebird and the Pontiac Grand Prix, which all turned into massive successes. The interior included a wraparound cockpit-style instrument panel, bucket seats, and center console. John sold a way of life, not just a cool, fast car. And suddenly, John DeLorean was the golden child. With success came popularity. During this time at Pontiac, DeLorean had begun enjoying the freedom and celebrity that came with his position and he spent a good deal of time traveling. His frequent public appearances helped to solidify his image as a rebel corporate businessman with his trendy dress style and casual banter. DeLorean lived, partied, and traveled like a rock star. And at age 40, he became General Motors' youngest head of a division, but he didn't dress or behave like other business executives. He disregarded organization rules, appeared in public spotlights frequently, and branded himself as a rebel with his outlandish celebrity lifestyle. With his fame and playboy lifestyle, John's first marriage fell apart. He had married a receptionist, Elizabeth Higgins, when he was young. Now John married supermodel Kelly Harmon. She was 20, he was 44. It was a star-studded affair. John even made Lee Iacocca, the president of Ford, his best man at the wedding. By this time, DeLorean earned an annual salary of $200,000, with yearly bonuses of up to $400,000, equivalent to $3 million a year today. At a time when business executives were typically conservative, low-key individuals in three-piece suits, DeLorean wore long sideburns and unbuttoned shirts. DeLorean began mixing with Hollywood royalty, regularly seen with Sammy Davis Jr. and Johnny Carson. John even became part owner of the San Diego Chargers and the New York Yankees. 1970. Everything was perfect for John. Even as the company faced revenue declines, the Pontiac stayed highly profitable under DeLorean's leadership. And despite his reputation as an outgoing maverick, he became vice president of General Motors car and truck production in 1972. The next logical step would have been for him to become president of the company. However, to many executives at General Motors, John's playboy lifestyle was quickly getting old, and many didn't believe a man so unwilling to conform to corporate policy was ready to take over as president, so he was passed up for promotion. But by now, John had outgrown General Motors. In fact, he had outgrown all car companies. So just a year later, in 1973, at age 48, John DeLorean left General Motors to create his masterpiece. 1973, John DeLorean had a vision to build his own company, and with it, a sports car that the world had never seen before. He wanted everything in this car. His vision was for a two-seater sports car, which he would call the DeLorean Safety Vehicle. With a body shell designed by Italian designer Giorgietto Giagario, the man who created the Maserati Merrick, the Lotus Spree, and the Fiat 850 Spider. DeLorean's car had a stainless steel body and featured gullwing doors, and it was powered by a Dovrin V6 engine made by PJ, Renault, and Volvo. The vision, however, took a long time to be realized and was plagued with delays and cost overruns. It took nearly eight years for the first cars to be produced. John had sunk everything into his company, and his money and reputation were all drowning around him. DeLorean outsourced everything, and the international factories could not keep up. In Dunmarie, in the UK, the manufacturing plant only turned out 9,000 cars, despite promising far more. And in 1980, an American Express catalog with an ad for a gold-plated DeLorean promised 100 cars for $85,000. In reality, only four were actually produced. To make matters worse, in 1981, when the DeLorean cars finally hit the market, the car industry was changing due to an icy economic recession. Demand for sports cars had shrunk, and the lukewarm reviews from critics and the public were just insult to injury. And frankly, there were better, more powerful cars out there for cheaper, namely the Chevy Corvette. By 1982, the DeLorean Motor Company was $175 million in debt. Many wondered where he got the money and how he could survive such financial problems. For many people, this would be rock bottom. But for DeLorean, this was just the beginning of the bad news. 
The year the company went into debt, the British government found that DeLorean had built only 9,000 cars, and half of the funds provided to him in 1974 were transferred to a Panamanian account under the name General Product Development Services. This was the company meant to pay Lotus for its roles in manufacturing the chassis for the DeLoreans, but the money had never made it to Lotus head Colin Chapman's account. He had died mysteriously at the start of the investigation into the missing funds. However, that investigation ended when another incident forced the British government to outright seize the factory for good. With crushing debt and an incomplete dream, DeLorean chose to turn to drug trafficking. On October 19, 1982, only one year after the release of his DeLorean automobile, John was charged by the U.S. government with trafficking cocaine. Entered into evidence was a videotape where he walked into an FBI drug sting in a hotel near the Los Angeles airport and tried to sell 50 pounds of cocaine. The federal agents on site stated DeLorean was trying to help his financially declining company by selling cocaine worth $24 million. The world was stunned. Was it true? People had no problem believing that DeLorean could fall into the trap of drug trafficking given his lifestyle and working at General Motors, but that certainly isn't the whole story. During the trial, it came out that the government was tipped off about DeLorean by an informant named James Timothy Hoffman, a former neighbor who claimed that DeLorean approached him to suggest a deal. In reality, Hoffman was the one who suggested the deal when he learned that DeLorean was struggling to finance his company and urgently needed $17 million. The trial ran for over two years and DeLorean successfully defended himself with the defense of entrapment. His lawyers argued that the FBI and DEA had unfairly targeted and entrapped DeLorean when they allowed Hoffman, a criminal and an active FBI informant, to randomly recruit DeLorean simply because he was vulnerable. On August 16, 1984, DeLorean was found not guilty and allowed to continue his life. But what did he have to go back to? His company had already collapsed, and his reputation couldn't be salvaged. Not a year later, he was once again taken up on the charge of defrauding investors and committing tax evasion. He was acquitted of all charges, but at this point, there was nothing left to save. When the judge asked him if he planned to return to the auto industry, DeLorean said, Would you buy a used car from me? In 1984, as disgraced John DeLorean was about to disappear from the public eye, the future came calling in the form of Universal Studios. Director Steven Spielberg was producing a time machine movie and the script called for the time machine to be made from an automobile. The film's writers had suggested the rare and uniquely designed DeLorean. John DeLorean was paid nothing for the use of his automobiles, but his prize was bigger than anything he could have ever dreamed of. Back to the Future went on to become one of the most successful movies of the 1980s, and the DeLorean automobile would go on to become the star in the movie. The movie gave DeLorean's automobiles a life of their own, turning all remaining cars into collector's items and skyrocketing their value like rare Picassos. In 2017, a used DeLorean sold for over $500,000 at auction, and the value is still going up. As for John, it seemed as if he had burned through the best years of his life all too quickly, but he kept himself busy. On November 1st, 1994, at the age of 69, DeLorean filed a patent for a raised monorail support, which was never built. John spent his retirement on his 434-acre Bedminster estate until he was forced to sell it to pay off debts. He sold it to developer Donald Trump in 2000, who converted it into a golf course. A few years before his death, it seems John planned to resurrect DeLorean Motor Company, and he gave several interviews talking about the DMC-2. Unfortunately, he never did manage to revive the company the way he had hoped. In 2005, at the age of 80, John Zachary DeLorean died in the Overlook Hospital in New Jersey from a stroke. John's tombstone shows a depiction of his beloved sports car with the gullwing doors open, cementing his love for the craft and his legacy. But the story doesn't end there. The DeLorean Motor Company is being relaunched. Thanks to the popularity of Back to the Future, as well as new excitement and car designs from Tesla Motors, there is a new interest in resurrecting the DeLorean Car Company, and new designs for the DeLorean Alpha 5 are taking orders for a whole new generation. Though the original DeLorean didn't quite take off the way he wanted, it was respected and admired for the masterpiece that it was, and the DeLorean name lives on. If you enjoyed this video, subscribe to the channel for similar content and ring the bell to make sure you never miss a video. Thanks for watching.